Residents in Guinean capital celebrate the reported military coup in the country. Special forces announce dissolution of the constitution and detain President Alpha Conde. What does this mean for West Africa and the future of constitutional government? Chief Justice of Nigeria orders six state chief judges to explain the reasons behind conflicting court orders. This has been a major issue in Nigeria, especially with political cases. The senior advocate of Nigeria will be here to explain why it happens. Nigeria finishes 33rd place with uh, on the medals table as the Tokyo Paralympics end. Better than the Olympians did, but not as good as the Paralympics team at Rio 2016. Great to have you here on a Monday morning. Thanks for joining us on PLOS TV Africa. Welcome to The Breakfast. I am Osao Gyi. Obama. And I am Annette Felix saying good morning and I hope you enjoyed your weekend. It's a very beautiful uh, Monday morning today, the 6th of September 2021. Good morning, yes, Osaragi. Yes, good morning to you. How was your weekend? Ah, uh, eventful, eventful. And it just, you know, all brings back memories of what happened this weekend. Very sad events when you look nationally and on the wider African front. Now, in Guinea, the president, Alpha Conde, has been detained. His government has been toppled. The military has essentially taken over, suspended the constitution, the National Assembly, locked all land and air borders into Guinea. Now, here's a full gist. On Sunday, Guinean soldiers um, went ahead to um, near the presidential palace in Conakry and just began a shootout, right? Now, Colonel Mamadi Domboya of the Guinea military, um, in a video addressed to Guineans, said that, you know, the National Assembly had been dissolved. He had essentially taken over power. And um, we've seen reactions to this, especially from the Nigerian government here, one of the largest voices in Africa. Um, the Buhari administration basically has been ordering the Guinean government um, to restore order, the Guinean military to restore order. And this statement was actually issued on Sunday by Esther She's a spokesperson for the Nigerian Foreign uh, Affairs Mil Ministry. Now, she's saying that this coup d'etat in Guinea um, basically violates the ECOWAS protocol on democracy and good governance. She went on to say that the Nigerian government is really saddened by this coup d'etat that has taken place in the Republic of Guinea and that the Nigerian government strongly condemns and rejects any unconstitutional takeover of power. They are now going ahead to call on those behind the coup to restore constitutional order without delay and protect all lives and properties. It's a mess in Guinea right now. What happened on Sunday took us back to August 15th. What happened in Afghanistan, how a terrorist Islamist organization essentially took over power from that country and is now running the place. That's exactly um, what's, I mean, that's similar to what's happened in, in Mali, except that it's not a terrorist organization. It is the military of the country. But the funny thing is, unlike in Afghanistan, where people are actually running away from the country, where they seem to be in despair, where they seem to be shocked, people are throwing in the airport, wanting to leave, afraid of what the consequences might be. It's a different reaction in Guinea. The people seem to rejoice. I mean, look at the videos you're seeing on your screen. There is excitement, you know, in Guinea. And people, you know, just all take this back to how um, politicians win elections in Africa, saying when you do not really have, you know, the favor of the people, when you really are not the people's choice, when it seems that elections are rigged in Africa and politicians take power by force, that's what happens in Africa. Well, there are two very different uh, scenarios, Afghanistan and Guinea. Um, so you wouldn't expect the same reaction. Uh, Afghanistan wasn't necessarily a coup. Uh, it was a takeover of government by a military or by a terrorist organization that has been there, you know, since, you know, the 90s for a very, very long time. Um, for Guinea, it's totally different. Uh, you know, my uh, major concern, you know, with them, you know, and of course looking at Guinea is, is you know, seeing what has r really happened with francophone countries in the last you know few months and years um you know from chad to mali and of course the assassination of the haitian president uh, not uh, no, very long ago 
Um, so it seems like every country that was colonized by France, you know, seems to be having some chaos or the other. Um, I'm not sure what to interpret, you know, from that or, you know, if there is any influence from, from foreign powers, you know, with all of this or there's something that we still do not understand yet. As expected, the um, African Union and ECOWAS have put out statements condemning the coup, same with the Nigerian government. Um, Afrikandi, I believe, has you know, <coughs> some close links with uh, the Dara Emirate or Katsina State. Um, I believe that he has some relationship with them, so I, I expected that from the Nigerian government. Um, but it doesn't change much, you know, and this really also just shows from, you know, recent happenings in other countries, also including Francophone countries, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that the African Union and ECOWAS have not really, really been a, you know, very, very strong body. They have a lot of bark, but, you know, really no bite. And that's why some of these uh, military, this is really a, a lieutenant colonel, not even a general mm -hmm. um, in the army who was taking uh, charge here, pretty much the same thing in Mali and Chad. Um, and it really just shows that they, you know, these persons or whoever it is that is bankrolling or, you know, behind these persons also knows that the ECOWAS and African Union don't have that much of uh, power to convince them to do otherwise. With regards to the people celebrating, um, Alpha Conde somehow, some way, bent the constitution to favor him in, in, into a third term not long ago. And it was one of the things that was a challenge in Guinea. Um, and so I agree with you when you said that, you know, yes, when you don't have the full backing of the people, uh, you, you know, eventually get to see people celebrating when you, you know, are, are you know, thrown out of power like this. It's a very, very shocking, um, you know, change of events between where he was last week and where he is today, and looking at how small you immediately become when power is taken from you. Looking mm. at those pictures, very embarrassing pictures, and he's going to live yeah. forever with those pictures all, all over the internet, seeing what has happened. Um, what will happen next? You know, nobody would be entirely sure. Will the African Union or ECOWAS in any other country be able to bully these soldiers into, um, you know, having a rethink? I don't think so, because, of course, you know the penalties for... Um, you know, overthrow of government or for, you know, uh, um, uh, treason or, so, or some of all of that might be death. Um, so very likely they will not be able to. It also is very, very imp important to see, um, you know, like I mentioned, the reaction of the people celebrating this because maybe they weren't huge fans of Avakonde in the first place um, and they would like to see a change in government. But, you know, I don't know if mm -hmm. they also understand um, the peculiarities with having a military takeover. And, you know, moving away, you know, even if it might be temporarily from a democratic um, institution in government, um, do the people understand that or do they even not care at this point? And that's one very, very that's what it vital seems part. Like. It seems like a lot of people um, in African countries They just countries say, out of the old. Care. Exactly. They don't, they don't, not they don't care much. The they don't really care it's, much for what happens next. You know, that's what the environment seems like. They just want a change in the status quo. Yeah, so... Um, Pretty much, you know, same. You know, it's not it's not necessarily an out with the old scenario. It is a whatever it is, you know, for us to get away from this government that hasn't really favored us. Even if you're bringing a native mm. a doctor, mm -hmm. you know, to take over power, we would accept it. And that, you know, paints a picture of what leadership in Africa has been like for a very, very long time. All right. So just a quick update regarding this story. We know that the World Cup qualifiers, also was holding Guinea, has definitely been postponed as a, as a result of this. Um, just when we think it couldn't get any worse, here in Nigeria, we saw um, just another example, because lots and lots of these cases we see every day in the news, just another example of the failure of our security you know, infrastructure in the country. Um, the brother of Omoyeli Showare, um, Sahara Reporters publisher, convener of the Revolution Now movement, um, whose name is Olajide Showare, has been killed. Olajide was a student of the Igbenedian University Okada, and um, he was killed on Saturday along the Lagos um, Benin Expressway. Five people were allegedly abducted in that particular incident, and um, the police spokesperson in Edo State say, said that they're on top of the matter and that here's what they're doing to um, basically get justice. They're combing the bushes, combing the forest in collaboration with vigilante um, um, groups in Edo State, and that the police is trying to find the perpetrators. As at now, we have no word from the kidnappers um, of those, those people, no word um, from, from the killers, no, no, no word yet from the police regarding have they found these people, the people who were kidnapped, are they making um, a ransom demand? So it's, it's just, everything is just in a haze right now. 
But, you know, people are saying that this is what you get in a country where anything goes. People are killed on a daily basis. People are abducted on a daily basis. It only now seems to be a big deal when it happens in their numbers, like we see in the north, and then when, you know, it affects someone who's popular or close to them. You know, but it seems now be our daily reality. Kidnappings, killings, and just general insecurity. Yes, and very likely if this happened to somebody else who wasn't a uh, um, you know, brother, yeah, we probably wouldn't even be taking the story now. But you know, it really tells that every part of the country at this point is you know dealing with the same insecurity challenges, and a lot of people don't you know bother um, taking road trips anymore. Um, Sadly, of course, this happened to Omoye Shoure's uh, Shoure's brother, but it could have happened to any other Nigerian that maybe very likely wouldn't make the news. I have a friend whose uncle was kidnapped in you know Benin City also uh, sometime last week. Um, they still haven't heard from uh, the kidnappers, wow. but at that point, you know, they really were just putting money together to see um, and then waiting for whenever that call comes. So um, it's 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 a scary and very very frightening period that we are in Nigeria. Um, if a lot of people have, you know, asked, we are the people who were very, very vocal a couple of years ago with, you know, pretty much not even half of what you know, we're dealing with now. They don't seem to be saying the same thing. And that's because some of those voices have been silenced. But that's a totally different angle. Um, as we're talking about, because I read the story on Saturday morning, I was here on the news. While we're talking about that, we're also seeing in uh, Katsina State that a member of the House of Assembly's wife also was kidnapped in Katsina State, along with many, many others um, incidents that have happened. The Katsina State National um, State House of Assembly, I saw a video of them uh, crying members of the house crying to Mr. Speaker, you know, and asking that something must be done in Katsina because it seems one. to be a very, very, very terrible um, dire situation in Katsina. But that really paints a picture of what it is like in a lot of parts of Nigeria today. Do we trust that the Nigerian police will be able to rescue these five? Because I also like the fact that they, the five who have been kidnapped haven't been left out of the conversation. And the death of uh, Olajide Shawari hasn't over, you know, shadowed the, five, the, the uh, fact that there's still five people who are in captivity currently hoping that those people would, you know, get out. Hoping that somehow, someway, they would either be rescued or, pay, you know, ransom would be paid, but they need to go back to their families. And this very likely also students from the Indian University of Okada or, um, or whatnot. But something else I would say is, if you drive from Lagos to Benin, it's, it's um, you know, the same way it has been described, driving from Lagos to the southeast. The number of checkpoints that you see, police checkpoints that you see, is, is hard to believe. So, which is an irony it, when, you, yes, when you compare it, it with what, what happens regarding security on those roads. It is hard to believe that there are this many checkpoints and you know, the use of this many checkpoints. Because there aren't so many. It's not a terrorist, you know, um, 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 a route. So I don't understand why there are so many checkpoints. Some people, before people would say they would count up to 30 or 40 checkpoints in just one stretch. You know, it feels like every, you know, one kilometer you drive, there's a new checkpoint there. Checking the same thing that the person behind you has checked. Um, so how do you still have kidnappers being able to thrive between um, Okada and Benin City? Good and, question. And, and it makes arguing. absolutely no sense. But once again, um, rest in peace, Olajide. Uh, condolences to the Shorori family. And we hope that these five will be found um, and rescued we also hope that some of these kidnapping gangs, something must happen. There has to be something done. Amen to that. Let's wrap up with sports and top trending this morning. The Tokyo um, 2020 Paralympics has ended. It ended on Sunday with Nigeria, Team Nigeria, placing 33rd on the medals table with a total of 10 uh, medals. We won four gold, one silver, and went ahead to uh, snatch five bronze medals. Um, the Tokyo um, Paralympics outing has been described as the poorest in recent times. And that's because Nigeria had the lowest number of medals, 10 earlier, like I mentioned. Some quick facts about that. Team Nigeria um, was represented by only 22 athletes at the Games. And uh, at the Rio um, 2016 uh, uh, Paralympics, when we go ahead and compare uh, out in uh, the Tokyo 2022 uh, previous performance, we saw that in Rio, uh, the Rio Games in 2016, Team Nigeria had 23 athletes. We placed 30th on the medals table and we won 12 medals made up of eight gold. We had four good this time around, two silver and two bronze. At the Athens Games in 2004, Nigeria had 14 athletes represented. They, um, they won 12 medals, that's five gold, four silver and three bronze, and we placed 23rd. Um, so you can understand why they say this is one of the poorest um, 
um, you know, Paralympics outing we've ever had. But at the end of the day, you still can't take away from the giant strides they're making anyway when you compare that with our regular team. You know, the, the achievements is not even comparable because they're doing so well. And it just goes ahead to, you know, show why I am so passionate about reporting persons with disabilities because they have gone ahead to show that disabilities is not a limitation, whether it's physical, whatever it is. You know, these people um, that are physically challenged, as they are so-called, go ahead to push the limits of their bodies and prove to the world that they can achieve much. You know, so it's fantastic. The next um, Paralympics will hold in Paris in 2024. Yeah, um, just briefly would say um, proud of them. Beth. Um I, I, I don't you know, want to even include the conversation about this being the worst because they've done exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. um, it took more than just um, um, you know, determination. It took a lot for them to be there and to win these medals, even with you know, the, you know, uh, you know the disabilities that you've mentioned. You know, which completely haven't stopped them in any way at all. So I'm completely proud of them. Um, even if they came back home with one medal, I am completely proud of these uh, Nigerians. And you know, I really hope that we are able to transform, um, or you know, give them or show them actual benefits of taking part in the Paralympics and winning. You know, they they, they should. And I said this, you know, uh, uh, before when we were, you know, uh, um, we were talking about the Olympics, that there should be more support for. Uh, Nigerian sportsmen and women by Nigerian brands. We shouldn't wait for international sporting brands to sign or to give them, you know, um, um, you know, benefits or you know whatever it is, financial benefits, make them ambassadors, whatever it is. There have to be Nigerian brands that see these people and realize there's been quite that they a few, be but it could be more. I, I don't think they're enough. I don't think there's any there's any big enough brand that really takes this thing seriously. There, there is. I don't want to mention names for marketing purposes, um, but there are Nigerian brands who have gone all not, out not, for supporting not enough, to support not enough, Paralympians um, for it to make. Um, headlines, not enough for it to be a thing that everyone is aware of, you know, and, and that's really what I'm hoping that we'll be able to achieve. The support for our sports should, you know, should be more support. I understand that there's banks who support basketball, there's, you know, um, um, beverage brands who support, you know, one sport or the other here, you know, in the country, but there should be more support for Paralympians and for those people who go over there. Let the benefits of winning some of these things be more than just pictures and your name being in the, you know, history, history books. So that's it on Top Trending for you this morning. We told you about the military takeover in Guinea. We went on to tell you about the younger brother of Omoyele Shore, convener of the Revolution Now movement and publisher of Sahara Reporters. His name is Olajide Shore. He was killed, um, unfortunately, by gunmen, as the police have confirmed on Saturday in Edo State. Also, we told you about a Nigerian team at the Paralympics in Tokyo. Um, fantastic one there, 10 medals haul. Let's take a break here and join our guests who are standing by to help us analyze the papers.